And we are live. Welcome to another incredible Freedom Media Network interview. Listen, in this COVID-19 era, the world has become homeschoolers. And at the same time that the world is homeschooling, the other side has stepped up their attacks on homeschooling. We're going to talk about all that and more today with our guest, Carrie McDonald, when we return. Well, it has been, Carrie and I were discussing offline. It's been almost exactly one year uh, since uh, she came out and we had a discussion about her book, Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside the Conventional Classroom. She's a senior fellow, in addition to authoring that book, she's a senior education fellow at the Foundation for Economic Education and an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, regular Forbes contributor. She is a homeschooling mom as well. You have four kids just like us, lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and I should also say that you are, and this will become the reason I'm bringing this up, uh, you have a master's degree in education policy from Harvard University, which we'll probably discuss today. Carrie, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to be back with you, Kurt. Thanks for having me. So yeah, offline, we were talking about that you've been busy because uh, with the response and the school shutdowns here to COVID, the world has become homeschooling uh, or homeschoolers, which uh, it's almost, um, you know, you had the quote unquote mainstream publications calling you for advice, right? <laughs> That's right. It, it, as we were talking before uh, going live, it's been a very busy spring for me. Uh, certainly once the government lockdown orders came out and the schools shut down back in March, um, I started getting all kinds of calls from media outlets looking for insights uh, about homeschooling as 50 million U.S. students suddenly found themselves out of school and learning at home with their families with varying degrees of virtual schooling tied to their uh, to their school. So that was really busy. And just as that started to sort of fade kind of a month into this distance learning experiment that uh, American children are in encountering, Harvard Magazine uh, published their article in the latest issue of the Harvard Magazine alumni um, piece about the risks of homeschooling that highlighted longtime Harvard Law School professor Elizabeth Bartholet's real attack on homeschooling. Uh, and so that's been very busy over the last several weeks responding to that. There's been subsequent articles coming out of Harvard and the Harvard Gazette and uh, the Harvard Crimson, uh, as well as some other pieces spotlighting Bartholet's insights and some of her colleagues who oppose homeschooling. Looking back at 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 the at the beginning, kind of what kept you busy before the attack started, and and you know everyone kind of wanted to know, and I get a lot of questions. Hey, do, can you ha do you have any insights on what we can do because our kids are at home? And and at least for me, one of the things that I found early on was that people were gaining frustration. Now, well, because not only all of a sudden they're working from home, which they've never done before, and they're trying to school, you know, be teachers. But one of the things I noticed early on was that they were trying to replicate the school day in their home. And, and as we talked about it, I love your book, you know, we unschool our kids, which self-education and or self-directed education. And so in, in one realm, I think we were helpful in, listen, if there's a pandemic, enjoy your kids and love them, you know, don't, it, it, but what we do, I, I, I posted online, um, just kind of our, our overall philosophy of self-directed edu education. And someone who lives in our neighborhood said, that sounds like anarchy to me. You know, um, what, what, were, what were some of the things that you were seeing in terms of questions and frustrations and worries and fears and anxieties that parents had uh, in the early days of, of, and probably still now, of this COVID situation? Right. Well, one of the first articles I wrote back in March was for Boston NPR, um, really encouraging families, like you said, to avoid replicating school at home to the extent that they could. Um, in many cases, work that's being sent home uh, is, you know, kids can get through that work, that curriculum in just a couple of hours. And that leaves a lot of time in the day to explore various interests. And of course, this is frustrating for all of us right now. Um, fortunately, lockdowns are being lifted. Uh, varying degrees, but certainly in the beginning when this was all new and we weren't 
certain how severe the pandemic would be, uh, it was really difficult for families. And even even though um, you know we're, our just our routines were disrupted and our work and learning changed, there was so much, and there continue, continues to be so many resources and tools for families uh, to facilitate learning and discovery. Uh, I had an article in the at the Cato Institute talking about the tremendous online learning resources that have been sprouting uh, almost daily, where you know, we're able to tap into humans and resources and content that we've never been able to do before. I mean, I love seeing Mo Willems, the famous author and illustrator of uh, the Piggy and Gerald children's books, for example, offering daily live streamed workshops for kids on, yeah. uh, on, on how to not only draw some of his characters, but how he created these stories and encouraging um, art, art, artistic talent and creativity in children, something that we all would never have been able to access before. So there's just incredible human capital, I think, coming out of this that we're able to tap into through technology, through many of these free online learning resources and learn together as a family uh, that, you know, I think we would lose some of that spontaneity and some of those experiences if we were tied to a curriculum. Yeah. And, and a lot of people don't realize necessarily they think that, oh, well, you were, you guys were made for this, right? You homeschool. So this is nothing new. And I, th I think what they don't realize is, be especially that we unschool is the museums are closed. Mm -hmm. We can't go certain places. Barnes and Noble to us is like Disney world. You know, they're, they're, we're out doing things more than just sitting here. And so we have learned to do, you know, Netflix is actually can be a wonderful resource uh, and documentaries and Apple and uh, curiosity stream. And some of those things with documentaries, if you have to be home, my daughter is taking, um, I think she's on the second one now, uh, foundation for economic education fee, uh, online economics course. She's 14 loves it. Um, but I think that, yeah, that, that trying to replicate, I I've seen some parents realize, uh, a, you know what, we're going to give up because our teachers are, have decided not really to grade it or, or to weight it because there's a lot going on with, I mean, heck for us, it's mentally hard with what's going on. Some days I wake up and I think I'm in a, like a different dimension. I, I can't understand what's going on. I can only imagine kids. Um, yeah. but I, I've seen some parents also realize <laughs> how from trying to replicate the school day at home, how little, well, I, I'm trying to say it in a way that's not going to offend teachers or something, but I kind of, I don't care. It, they, re, they realize how little work actually gets done at school. And this is something I've heard from teachers as well. They describe mo much of the day as crowd control oh. and, and the actual work that gets done. And I think that's what, maybe why parents complain a lot because they see so much homework at, during the day that doesn't get done. Um, and uh, have, have you seen something similar from some parents? <laughs> right. Well, I think a couple of things. First, you're right. Um, those of us who are homeschoolers, of course, that this is nothing like conventional homeschooling. In fact, I think you're right. In many ways, it could be harder on us um, <laughs> to rely so much on these community resources that our kids aren't going to just one building every day uh, for their learning. We are learning through the people, places, and things of our communities that, of course, we've been shut off from um, for the past uh, several weeks. And so I think it has been really difficult on everybody and, and homeschoolers included. So I got the right. responses that you did. Oh, well, this must just be old hat and exactly what you're used to. And it, it's like, no, you know, we're very much um, immersed in our communities and in fact, spend yeah. more, time, more of our time outside of our homes typically than inside of our homes. Uh, but I do think that it's been a really interesting time for families to be able to, as you suggest, get a glimpse of what happens in school. So not only might they see how quickly they, their kids can actually get through content and curriculum without the distractions and the crowd control that happens in conventional schooling, they also might be surprised to see um, a closer look at the daily curriculum. I had a neighbor, for example, who you know, in the first few weeks of the pandemic, had one of the public school uh, teachers of her daughter, she's 10 years old, reading a book to the class through Zoom 
um, that was a book that this particular child had read to herself several years prior. Uh, and the family was like, hmm, that's interesting. You know, what actually is happening in school? Um, you know, maybe my child really isn't being challenged. And then, you know, they were really able to separate themselves from the curriculum to a large degree and really see their child flourish with this freedom and start writing, you know, short stories that were meaningful to her and read books uh, that, that she really cares about uh, and see that creativity and that curiosity rekindled and flourished outside of the conventional classroom. And I think you're right too, that, that many districts, well, certainly um, schools have canceled in-person classes for the rest of this yeah. academic year, but to some, uh, in some areas, the, the virtual learning has also ended. So some districts have just said, you know, we're done with the 2019-2020 uh, school year and right. we're ending earlier, which I think again gives families an opportunity to really uh, separate from these curriculum directives and explore some of this amazing content. Uh, and again, now that, that things are starting to open up, be able to um, reconnect with these various people, places and things of our community that are so vital to learning. You know, one, one of the things I hear pandemic or no pandemic is, uh, you know, and, and the quote from the person we know, like, Oh, it's anarchy. Um, and my response is, well, haven't you met our kids? Y you know, just spend some time with our kids, which everyone has, and they're not, you know, zombies walking around. And of course, uh, you know, the most common thing I hear is, well, socialization. What about socialization? Or the second is, um, well, I knew a homeschooler when they, when I was growing up and I said, don't tell me they were weird. Right. Yeah. How'd you know? I'm like, cause everyone says that or has known, like, have you ever been through any other school and not seen people you would see weird or, or, or see as weird? Can you, can you explain to, to people watching whether it's homeschooling or specifically more unschooling? Um, you know, it's hard for us sometimes to to explain because it's very entrepreneurial, right? It, it, it's a, it's how do ideas come about anyways, outside of school, like remove yourself. How does Elon Musk run his company? How did Elon Musk come up with the idea to go to Mars, right? Whatever it is, or Steve Jobs say, we're going to put 10,000 songs in your hand and all this. But when you apply it to school, it's like somehow the laws of entrepreneurship and creativity don't exist. How do you explain to people that it is an anarchy and that without a set curriculum spelled out every minute of every day and you got to do this in math and you got to test this in math and you got to test this in English, how does that not lead to, or how does it not not lead to kids who are just not up to par academically? Well, I'll say a couple of things. Interesting that you brought up Elon Musk, who has said how much he hated school as a child and actually then created a private school that's, um, you know, much more self-directed and free and open for his kids called Ad Astra. Um, and many of his SpaceX employees also uh, take advantage of this particular private school that's project-based, focused on uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. So I think you're right that so much of that um, personal agency, curiosity, in ingenuity can be dulled through a system of conventional schooling. And fortunately, um, some of us, like Elon Musk, are able to overcome that and, uh, and keep that spark alive. But I think how tragic it is how many young people might have their uh, interests really derailed um, from a young age when they are taught that their interests don't matter, that their passions aren't important, uh, that you know this is the, the, the conveyor belt that you need to follow in order to achieve a good life, whatever that may be. Uh, and I think for those of us who advocate for self-directed education, unschooling, or alternatives to school more broadly, we'd say, you know, there's many ways to be educated and schooling is just one of those ways. And so when I talk about unschooling, I really talk about disentangling education from schooling, including school at home versions of homeschooling that of course everyone is uh, dealing with now, that that is just changing the location of school um, and not, not really tapping into the human drive to learn. Uh, so, you know, what, what I would say is that with unschooling, I often, I always preface this by saying that I think 
uh, parents are ultimately responsible for ensuring that their children are highly educated, highly literate and numerate. And I think that is true whether your children go to school or not, that it's really a parent's obligation to ensure their child is educated. Uh, with unschooling, that approach involves uh, cultivating your ch child's interests and encouraging their passions and then supporting those passions by connecting them to available resources. I think one of the myths about unschooling is that unschoolers may not use formal instruction or curriculum or testing. And nothing really could be further from the truth. And my children are, you know, case in point, my older daughter um, learns Korean language uh, that she's been doing for a couple of years, three times a week at the local library, now over Zoom uh, with her a native Korean language speaker. And she has a very standard curriculum, language learning curriculum with tests and quizzes. But this was something that's really meaningful to her that emerged from her interest in martial arts uh, and her goal to speak fluent Korean and to spend time uh, when she's an older teen in South Korea for a, a semester or a year abroad. Uh, so this is something, you know, that that she is pursuing. And I think you find that with unschoolers more generally. Peter Gray, the Boston College psychology professor who writes the foreword to my unschooled book and is a big unschooling advocate, um, he and his colleague Gina Riley did a survey of grown unschoolers and find out how they fared in adulthood with a more self-directed youth. And they discovered that, you know, unschoolers went on to college at same rates, if not more so than schooled peers, performed well there. If unschoolers wanted to go on the college track, many of them took community college classes in high school, uh, in some cases defraying the cost of college, being able to transfer some of those college credits into a four-year institution, so saving a lot of um, tuition costs there. And they went on to lead successful careers, in many cases tied to their interests that emerged in childhood and adolescence. And my favorite finding from this particular study of grown unschoolers was that more than half of the participants in this study were working as entrepreneurs. Interesting. It is, it is fascinating. And, and you have four kids, we have four kids. When you really spend a lot of time with your kids, you, you see how, um, uh, and, and I have empathy for many teachers in whether it's government school or, or private school or whatever, who have 30 or 40 kids in a classroom. Cause, cause having four kids, you see the, the vast differences between each of your four kids, same what genes, right? They come from the same parents and our daughter, she likes a little more structure, but she builds that structure. She, this morning, every Tuesday, she's on Skype learning Italian from Matteo from Milan, Italy. He's living in Scotland now. Our other son, uh, who's nine, I wake up. If I get up at six in the morning, he's already been up for an hour. He's read uh, cover to cover all the Harry Potter books, and now he's going through them again. So he loves that reading, and he'll find books. His older brother, not so much, but is more of a visual learner and said he wants to work at Lego uh, for Lego someday. But each of them is so different. And, you know, having done this for a while now, I can't even see how a, a just as, as someone who sends their kid to a, a government school looks at homeschoolers, like, how do you do that? I can't even see how a school can account for the individuality and the individual strengths and, and maybe some special needs of each individual. My, my, my wife's a speech therapist and worked in the school system. And some of just the horrific stories that she found of kind of cookie cutter approaches to dealing with some of these kids. And it was her experience working in the schools that she was like, no, we're not sending our kids to the school. So it, it, it's, it, it's that individuality of each and every kid. And, and as parents, you said it correctly. I mean, we are the first and last line of defense to educate our children, which as we'll talk about today, some people maybe necessarily don't agree that it should be that way, right? <laughs> well, yes, and just to follow on on your your point there, I think that um, you know it's interesting when you look at 
the fact that teachers are caught up in this system of conformity and control very much the same way that children are, that teacher creativity is eroded to the same degree as children's creativity. Of course, teachers can quit and children cannot due to compulsory schooling statutes, which again are being loosened during this pandemic. So I would argue there could be some potential uh, bright spots in terms of deregulation or at least um, questioning some of these um, 19th century statutes that still prevail. Um, but in my unschooled book, I spotlight many of these education entrepreneurs, these teachers who worked for the most part in public schools, became disillusioned by what they were seeing there and left. They said there has to be a better way, not finding one, they created their own. And many of them created these uh, micro schools or self-directed learning centers for homeschoolers, um, where you could re are registered as a homeschooler, but you can attend up to five days a week. So homeschooling really offering that freedom and flexibility um, at, to provide for a self-directed education uh, without some of the constraints associated with private schools. I also highlight the Sudbury model of education and democratic schooling in there as well, people who've started those kinds of programs. Uh, again, teachers, for the most part, that was one of the most surprising things in writing the book was uh, just how many former public school teachers were the ones who took the leap to leave that conventional classroom and create these stunning uh, alternative learning spaces. Yeah, and someone, uh, David Duncan, who's watching, he had asked earlier, how is homeschooling possible if both parents have to work? And Tom Meyer came in and, and talked about Sudbury School. And wow. so, yeah, David and, and anyone listening, I would recommend picking up Unschooling uh, Carrie's book, because you talk about other alternatives if parents work and, you know, we're, I work from home. My wife, um, uh, does not, or she's at home and she has a company that she works from home, I should say. And so we have that kind of luxury, I guess I, I hate calling it a luxury, but to be able to do that, but some parents don't, but there are alternatives and options for you to do that, which yeah. a lot of parents are probably looking at now. I, I saw a stat the other day, just kind of in flashing, on Facebook somewhere, maybe you've seen it in terms of that predicted 25% of parents may not send their kids back to school. Uh, maybe you shared it. I can't, uh, in the fall. So, yeah, so we're going to be looking. There's a, uh, there's been several of these surveys recently Ed choice did a survey of parents during the pandemic, asking them all sorts of questions. And they found that more than half of their respondents have a more favorable view of homeschooling as a result of the hmm. pandemic. So I would say, I'm sure you and I would say, uh, gee, if you think this is tolerable, just wait till you see the real thing, because this is <laughs> nothing like typical homeschooling. Um, but that's a good sign. And then another a recent survey of over 2,000 respondents coming out of real clear opinion research found that 40% of parents plan to homeschool or use virtual learning uh, after the lockdowns end. So there is definitely, uh, I think, a trend toward families at least looking for alternatives to school. I would be surprised if we don't see an uptick, not only in the number of homeschoolers, but also in virtual schooling, some of these hybrid homeschool models that I'm mentioning where your kids can be off site several days a week. Um, you know, in-home micro schools like the Prenda Network out of Arizona that's rapidly growing, uh, forest schools and outdoor programs that I think will become much more uh, popular and much more agile to meet the demands of different families. And, uh, and, and you know, so, so kind of segueing into some of the attacks that have been happening, I think it's important that in addition to the options, the homeschooling models and unschooling models that we're discussing, there's a lot of them out there, uh, but I think people may have grown up with a certain idea of what homeschooling is um, and don't fully realize that, especially now, although it's been this way for, for a little bit, that there is a vast amount of reasons mm -hmm. that people homeschool, um, you know, and my wife is on a variety of different groups. And it's interesting because we don't fall maybe in one group. You know, there's kind of the uh, a group that call themselves the hippie homeschoolers, you know, and then there's there's evangelical Christian homeschoolers, with which a lot of people, I think, as Elizabeth Bartholet talks about, like, that's the only people who homeschool. Uh, there's more kind of libertarian homeschoolers, entrepreneur homeschoolers. But it's not just this monolithic block of people 
Um, and I remember going to our first homeschooling conference, um, I don't know, 13, 14 years ago. And just, you could look at the people entering the auditorium and, and kind of pick out, okay, they're in that group, they're in that group, but it's this, it's a vast array of types of people and, and the reasons people homeschool from religious to moral, to social on and on and on. Right. Yeah. I mean, homeschooling really now, 21st century homeschooling is much more reflective of the overall U.S. population in every possible way, demographically, geographically, socioeconomically, ideologically, as diverse as the U.S. population, which is, I think, what is so surprising about the Harvard attack. And again, Professor Elizabeth Bartholet's Harvard Magazine interview, subsequent Harvard publications, which really highlight her 80 page Arizona law review piece that she recently published that was definitely in the pipeline well before uh, COVID-19 hit. So I think the timing is peculiar uh, in terms of us all talking about homeschooling, of course, when so many families are now at home learning with their children that uh, I'm sure was not on her radar when she submitted her Arizona law review piece and certainly right. The Harvard Magazine article came up, but it's it provides an interesting counterpoint to kind of what we're all experiencing. One of I and mean, there's so much to say about her Arizona Law Review piece in particular. This is the Harvard Magazine um, spotlight on that that you're showing here on the screen. Um, yes, yeah. One, but one of the most surprising pieces, I think, is what you're getting at is is this vast mischaracterization of modern US homeschooling, that it was really a caricature that she presented of homeschoolers as all you know, religious evangelicals. I mean, she says twice in her Arizona Law Review piece, for example, that up to 90% of today's US homeschoolers are driven by conservative Christian beliefs. And this is simply untrue. So, you know, I have a couple of things to say about this. Uh, first is that the most recent data from the U.S. Department of Education on homeschooling, where families are or parents are asked their top motivators for choosing to homeschool, um, a primary motivator, the motivator that families picked most often in this particular uh, survey to say why they chose homeschooling was concern about the environment of other schools in safety, drugs, and negative peer pressure. And only 16% of the um, respondents said that a desire to provide religious instruction hmm. was a top motivator. Uh, so the data just don't back this up. But I would also say to this larger point is, so what if 90% of today's U.S. homeschoolers were driven by conservative Christian beliefs? Why should that be a, a rationale for heavy regulation of the practice or what she's calling for as a presumptive ban on homeschooling. I found that to be particularly troubling. But, you know, you're right that the, the, the U.S. homeschool population today is incredibly diverse. Um, in fact, the number of black homeschoolers doubled between 2007 and 2012 to 8% of the homeschool population. The percent for Hispanic homeschoolers in the U.S. is 25% of the homeschool population, which mirrors the Hispanic representation in the overall K-12 school age population. Uh, you see, particularly in the last decade, the most growth in homeschoolers is coming from urban secular homeschooling families like mine, who want something different for our children, who find, you know, standardized test driven schooling to be incompatible with the realities of the 21st century innovation era. Uh, and so there's just tremendous uh, diversity in the overall homeschool population for a wide variety of reasons. And this, um, I, I really think that that Bartholet truly mischaracterizes uh, what today's homeschoolers are like. Yeah. And, and, and in the Harvard magazine, and by the way, you are, as I mentioned earlier, you are a Harvard grad. I mean, this picture is what really caught a lot of people's eye, uh, in terms of, of, of us making fun of the picture, but this notion that the non homeschool kids are all out having fun and playing when it's the homeschooler who's inside behind bars. Right. And it's funny that Certainly, if we wanted to uh, kind of take the gloves off, perhaps we could draw a picture that's like this, but just change the labels. 
that it's our kids who are out having fun <laughs> and skipping rope um, while other kids are are trapped inside for a full day. I know a relative has a school that they, they were forced into a Walmart for several years because their school and, and it just and the teachers were getting sick and, you know, from from the uh, the fluorescent lighting and, and things like that. Um, but it just it just shows this caricature that people still have of homeschooling. And, and I think, you know, you and, and Corey DeAngelis have pointed out that her, you know, if you're going to do a study, make it data-based. Uh, if you're going to write a paper, make it data-based. And that her favorite word is many. Mm. And it's kind of like me, I want to make a case on something. Oh, well, there's a ton. There's a ton of homeschoolers who are abused. There's just so many. Well, how many? Just so many, right? It, it, it's almost as if, she rushed into writing this being prodded by perhaps the uh, uh, the powers that be not liking the competition that has arisen from the COVID-19 crisis. I mean, is because we've, we've not only seen her attack, we've seen there was a UCLA professor this week who started attacking it, saying we should end homeschooling uh, and even said, if that's, if that's authoritarian, then I'm Stalin. Uh, the New York Times, there was another professor talked about the great harm that's being done uh, from homeschooling uh, in Oregon, I believe. Uh, they went and, and uh, shut down enrollments in virtual charter schools. Is this a concerted effort, you think, on behalf of the, uh, and I, I almost said teachers unions, but I think it's, it, isn't there more of kind of this, this educational industrial complex Illuminati that just doesn't like the competition? <laughs> I don't know that I'll get into conspiracy theories about this. I don't <laughs> think it's that sophisticated. I'll say yeah. a couple of things, though. I think first, that image that's in the Harvard Magazine piece that you showed, most of us who are homeschoolers took a look at that and just initially assumed that the kids running outside were the homeschoolers, right? And then you look closer and you realize that they're trying to portray that the poor homeschool child is the one that's uh, in inside. And fortunately, um, uh, my colleague Kevin Soling from Harvard, who was also on the Alliance for Self-Directed Education board with me for a while, uh, he organized through his student group at Harvard called Ideological Diversity, a response forum to this, what he calls the, the Harvard disinformation campaign against homeschooling that was held through the Harvard Kennedy School at the beginning of May. And uh, Kevin Soling is the award-winning documentary filmmaker of the, of the uh, film, The War on Kids, that came out in 2009, that very much shows that schools are the prisons. Uh, and and that these alternatives to school, including homeschooling, really provide that freedom and flexibility for, for young people that we just don't find in schools. So it was peculiar that uh, Elizabeth Bartholet in her uh, pieces talks about wanting to a presumptive ban on homeschooling because she's concerned about authoritarian control of children by their parents, when many of us would argue that there's nothing um, much more authoritarian than today's government schooling, where children are constantly um, monitored, they're constantly controlled, they're increasingly tested, uh, and have very few freedoms. So um, not to mention how authoritarian it is to call for a presumptive ban on homeschooling, um, which gets, I think, to, to the larger point that you're saying, what is the bigger context of all of this? And I, and I don't think it's some um, um, coordinated, you know, conspiracy. But I, I do think when you read the Harvard, excuse me, the Arizona Law Review piece, um, something that we should all be very concerned about that Elizabeth Bartholet gets toward the end of her piece is really wanting um, a reinterpretation of the U.S. Constitution. She says in her Arizona Law Review piece, the Constitution is outdated and inadequate and urges us to move from our historic interpretation of negative rights, meaning U.S. citizens are uh, free from state intervention, to positive rights, where the state grants rights and takes a much more interventionist role in, in all of our lives, and in particular, in the lives of families and children under the guise of safety and security. And I think that's something we are all getting a taste of right now with the 
government mandated lockdowns is this idea that the state can somehow grant liberties as opposed to um, staying out of our of our lives and, and protecting our liberties. So that is a, a more concerning piece and something I think we should all be very vigilant about, um, not only in the context of homeschooling, but in the context of um, the liberty interest of parents to care for and educate their children as they choose. This has been a precedent in the courts for quite some time. Uh, and so I think this speaks much more toward um, family rights, family freedom, and you know, overall individual liberty if we move to a positive rights interpretation of the Constitution. Yeah, and, it, and it's interesting here on that, uh, that she also writes it while, while saying that and kind of reinterpreting or saying that the Constitution could, should kind of be rewritten. She says that children should grow up exposed to democratic values, ideas about non-discrimination and tolerance of other people's viewpoints. Yeah. Well, what's that based on? Because I might say that the Constitution as written does exactly that <laughs> um, and is about freedom of, of uh, one of the democratic values is the freedom to educate your children, um, you know, and, and the kind of top down current mainstream schooling model, right. Is not how most humans were educated for most of humanity. Right. <laughs> and that, that statement about wanting a presumptive ban on homeschooling, essentially, uh, forcing young children or forcing children into government schools, or at least state approved private schools. Um, the statement of, ensuring diversity of other people's viewpoints or tolerance of diverse viewpoints, uh, when really this professor is being incredibly un intolerant towards uh, lifestyles, diverse ways of thinking, certainly hostile toward conservative Christian beliefs um, in particular. And, and But even if we want to talk about, you know, tolerance of different viewpoints, understanding of democratic values and civic virtues, you know, all you need to do is look at the most recent NAEP scores, the nation's report card um, that recently came out with the history, government, and civics scores, and they are abysmal and declining. Uh, and so, you know, the idea that somehow we're taught democratic values and civic virtues in schools is just not true. I mean, one of the things I talk about, I wrote a letter to the editor of Harvard Magazine right after this uh, article appeared and republished that at fee.org. And I br made the point that uh, 2017 uh, University of Pennsylvania study of adults found that 37 percent of Americans, uh, American adults could not name one right protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution or ensured by the First Amendment. They couldn't name one. Uh, and so clearly our you know, current system of education is not producing uh, adults who understand democratic values or you know, any understanding of uh, civic engagement. And yet there's really good evidence and peer reviewed studies that show that homeschoolers are um, well socialized that are in some cases more tolerant of diverse opinions than their school peers because they are immersed in their communities and really engaging with others um, on a regular basis. Okay, I think we're back. Hey. Can you hear me? Sorry about that. I, uh, my, the internet, this has happened uh, a number of times just with everyone doing zoom and, 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 and the like. So, uh, thank you for everyone who's watching. Uh, I think we lost you, Carrie. You were talking about, uh, the study showing that kids couldn't even name one and then you went blank. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I'm not sure if your viewers were able to hear it um, yeah. as well, but there was a, a study done um, by the University of Pennsylvania that found that 37% of American adults could not name one right protected by the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, so, you know, clearly we're not doing a great job with our current education system of um, preparing adults for life in a democratic civilization and civic values and virtues. And yet there's compelling evidence that homeschoolers are in fact much more tolerant of diverse viewpoints um, and incredibly well socialized um, because they are immersed in their communities on a regular basis given their flexible schedules. In fact, uh, Daniel Hamlin out of the University of Oklahoma published an article, uh, a journal article about a year ago, talking about the high rates of cultural capital 
what he calls cultural capital in homeschoolers um, because they are attending uh, cultural events, music events, sporting events, going frequently to the library and museum, in many cases, much more frequently than their school peers and have high levels of engagement with their larger communities, um, which of course breeds this tolerance of diversity and uh, exposure to different viewpoints. It, 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 you know, when you talk about the, the, the overall impact on individual liberties, I think that, you know, and, and Michael Strong, uh, you know, is a big uh, proponent of the Socratic method, which at its very core is questioning and using those questions to peel the onion. Elon Musk calls it first principles reasoning, you know, and I find that our kids question, we encourage them to question more and going out into the world and seeing more diverse opinions. You talk about that ideological diversity kind of requires a certain amount of empathy um, a certain amount of understanding that the differences and the, the diversity of opinions, but also having independent thought to where if you don't, if you see something that doesn't look quite right, yeah. you start questioning it in a healthy way. Yeah. And I think one of the things, you know, I, I keep seeing this, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist person, but there's certainly been a lot of conspiracy theories over the last couple months is this now connection between, um, uh, and they're using, you know, there's that movie, which I have not watched, uh, Plandemic. Have you heard about the, you know, the movie Plandemic about, and I think it's about vaccines and certain things. Well, it's been banned and all that. Now it's, I, I've seen in several cases, we have to limit homeschooling because what's it, it's doing, it's cr gonna create an army of conspiracy theorists. And that's dangerous for the country. And to me, I think, that conspiracy theory, conspiracy theories are one thing. Uh, I think we're fast becoming a, a nation where anything you don't agree with is labeled as a conspiracy theory, <laughs> you know? Um, but independent thought is absolutely necessary to a democratic society. But I guess if you think the constitution's outdated, maybe you think independent thought shouldn't be welcome in whatever new society you want to build. I don't know. Well, I think one interesting turn of events um, that we're seeing more recently uh, in, her, in Elizabeth Bartholet's more recent interviews and in some of her colleagues, uh, one thing we should mention is there was a Harvard Law School invitation only planned summit uh, in June that was to look more broadly, bringing in academics, again, invitation only from around the country to look more broadly at ways to implement this presumptive ban on homeschooling or heavily regulate the practice so that essentially it looks like, homeschooling looks like public school at home with very little autonomy and independence. Um, that was canceled because of, uh, you know, allegedly because of COVID uh, and has been postponed to a later date. Um, one of the things you do you do see, however, is Bartholet and some of her colleagues who uh, oppose homeschooling from around the country, academics in various places, um, now saying that because of the pandemic and young people not being in schools, calls to child protective service services are way down. Um, and they look at this as evidence that um, homes that children at home, not under the watchful eye of teachers and administrators and other what are known as mandated reporters of child abuse, potential child abuse, um, are more likely to then be abused. It's possible that that's true, but I think again to the to your point of let's question some of these assumptions. I might suggest that perhaps this looks, uh, you know, this reveals a child protective system gone awry. And in, I recently wrote an article at fee.org that gets into this a bit, where, um, you know, if you look at the, the Heckinger report and HuffPost did a comprehensive investigative report about a year and a half ago now, where they found that school districts frequently use CPS, Child Protective Services, as a weapon against families, particularly families that are non-compliant, that are not um, just 
just accepting whatever it is the school or the teachers want their children to do. Maybe it's involving a particular special education label or medication or some other kind of uh, recommendation from the schools and the parents are being non-compliant and then districts are weaponizing CPS mm -hmm. non-compliant families. So that was really an eye-opening um, investigative report, again, that HuffPost and the Heckinger report did about a year and a half ago, and I linked to that in my article. Um, there's also a very powerful book by longtime family defense attorney and advocate Diane Redleaf called They Took the Kids Last Night, How the Child Protection mm -hmm. Puts Family at Risk. And I, what I found really, um, there's so much in that book to, to really you know think about, but one of the, the statistics that we should all really be focused on is she says that in 2016 alone, 7.4 million U.S. children were reported as su suspected victims of child abuse or neglect, CPS, but only, well, not only, but 676 children were ultimately labeled victims of abuse and neglect. So you're really, you know, terrorizing millions of children and families um, and engaging in warrantless search and seizure and interrogation to uh, potentially save a few. And I think that's something we really should be concerned about and is really at the heart, I think, about uh, of Elizabeth Bartlett's overall attack on homeschooling is that we need to regulate everybody or ban almost everybody um, to protect a very small number of, of children who may in fact be being abused. Well, that, that type of thinking is, is very common these days. <laughs> I want to save one life. I may kill four in the process, but I'm going to save one life from COVID-19. Um, and apparently give up all those liberties sort of right. result of that. I mean, really, this is um, such a timely topic in so many ways, whether we talk about homeschooling or parental rights or just individual liberty more generally. I, there was a, there was an article in reason uh, a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago, uh, in which a uh, homeschool family, I think of six or seven went into a bank. Did you see that? And, yeah. and it, there was a stay at home or not a stay at home. There was a, a, there was a socially distancing thing, but there were one family oh. and it was apparent that they got into it and they, that by the time they got home, there was a government official there that went in and actually laid his hands on their children, pulling up the sleeves and it was an apparent lie because the kids were wearing long sleeves and whoever at the bank reported that there were bruises and all that. And I posted that online and it was, it was interesting that people who maybe, who, who obviously don't homeschool, you know, sitting through some, I remember sitting back when we lived in Illinois through some legislative hearings and listening to some truant officers describe what they would do and how they would go into a home and how they would try to get around the Illinois uh, laws, which the, the Supreme Court had basically ruled homeschoolers as the same as Catholic schools. And you don't mess with the Catholic schools in Illinois, that they would try to pass things like uh, fire codes, that, that they could get into schools less than five children or less than 10 children so they could get into your home. And the notion that certainly I want there to be protections for the least vulnerable among us, children. But the notion that anyone based on some sort of prejudice or some sort of they had a bad day can have a government official go into your home and and put their hands on your kids. And, and the guy started go going into their cupboards and things like that. That is something that from an individual liberties perspective, to me, I, I, I can't imagine a parent would be okay with that. Right. Um, and, you know, back to the, the reason story that you mentioned, I mean, there's, there's so much there to be disturbed by, you're right, this was a, um, a family that had just moved to the state, the mom had gone ahead with, I think they had seven children, the dad was coming later, um, and she was trying to set up her bank account. And yes, you're right, social distancing orders had come into play. And, and you know, I think those of us who have a bunch of kids. I have four, you have four. Um, you know, there's often this tension like, well, if I leave my kids in the car, then I could get somebody right. called the police. So I might as well bring them in. And my heart just goes out to this mom who's probably trying to weigh the risks and thinks, all right, well, it's probably better if we all go into the bank. And then sure enough, this happens. Um, just a real tragic story.
And, and my wife and I were talking yesterday about the, you know, when the school started closing down, it, it was it was interesting that there were some people who expressed their biggest reason for not wanting the schools to shut down was what you talked about in terms of the schools being what they said is the first line of defense mm-hmm. to uncovering abuse, right? The teachers are often the people who see it. And the other thing was school lunches. Now, to me, I understand that. And I understand, right, no matter what the policy is, I may disagree with it, but if all of a sudden you pull the rug out right away, there are going to be people who are negatively affected. I get that. But to your point, isn't that more of a reason to fix, like you said, the CPS system, our ability to detect abuse rather than just say, well, we're not going to reform the school system at all because it's the first line of, I mean, the, the school system was not meant to be the first line of a, a defense to detect abuse. So where's that front, that fine line between there was that, but we also don't want a CPS system where we give up our individual liberties. Right. And then, I mean, I think, you know, if it is true that some, um, that there is a heightened risk or heightened incidences of child abuse during this time, and I don't think we have any, you know, data yet to show that being the case, but you could imagine the possibility, but that's because of the government lockdowns, right? Yeah, right. So, I mean, it's because of the tremendous stress that we have put on families right now, not allowing parents to work, um, cutting everyone off from their communities and from their support systems. Uh, and so certainly, you know, if anything, that it's the, it's the government lockdowns that are, that would lead to, uh, increased mental health issues or potential domestic violence. Um, so, you know, the answer is to end the lockdowns, the government involvement there. Um, you know, I, I think there is this balance between individual liberty and protecting the most vulnerable. But I, I, and I, and certainly we get, we need to be persecuting, um, prosecuting, excuse me, <laughs> persecuting homeschoolers, but we need to be prosecuting any family, uh, any person who abuses children. One of the things that uh, I spotlight in my response to the Harvard Magazine article, and that certainly we've been bringing up in our counter conference at the Harvard Kennedy School and in other um, in other publications, though, is the fact that abuse is widespread mm-hmm. in government schools, in these school systems that the opponents to homeschooling are upholding as the gold standard. You know, I mean, we see headlines abound of public school teachers and administrators who are arrested and convicted for physical abuse of children. Of course, peer abuse is widespread, often, or not often, but sometimes fatal uh, to children in school with widespread bullying. And then a 2004 US Department of Education study found that one in 10 uh, U.S. public school students would be sexually abused by a public school educator by the time they graduate from high school. So, you know, why, trusting an institution like the government school system to um, regulate homeschoolers seems misguided, not to mention the fact that most peer-reviewed studies of homeschoolers find better uh, academic and social outcomes of homeschoolers than schooled peers. And some research shows that homeschoolers on average are much less likely to be abused than schooled peers. Yet you hear anytime there is a a case, and they do happen, but it's not, uh, you know, <laughs> this 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 epidemic as as Elizabeth Bartholet would have you believe, anytime there is a case where there has been an instance of abuse, Right. I think it, what was it? Iowa in Iowa a couple of years ago. That one story is used to make people believe, see, see, that's why we don't do it. And I, I, I see that happening now with any time anyone under the age of 50 battles COVID-19, it is immediately put up as evidence, despite all the data, that this virus doesn't discriminate when in fact, if you look at the, at the data, it really does discriminate. And if you're under 50, under 40, whatever. Um, yes. Right. And so it's, it's yeah. the exceptions to drive the rule. And if we were to do that, then, you know, we would have to say, well, look at the widespread abuse by school and, ed- you know, educators on children that should call for a presumptive ban on schools. But of course, we're not saying that. We're just saying we're 
pointing out potential exceptions in the homeschooling community and saying, well, see, this, you know, small incidence of abuse means that we have to crack down on this particular population. Uh, and it's really disturbing to single out a particular group for persecution and for increased oversight monitoring um, by the government officials, by, in many cases, the institutions that these families are fleeing. The So 50 states and each of them have vastly different regulations when it comes to homeschooling. Um, the attacks that we see in the, the the New York Times articles and some of the other pieces that we see around the country, should homeschoolers be concerned? Is this, um, you know, as I've raised this, people are like, oh, but don't, that's just Harvard blowing smoke. It doesn't mean anything. Nothing's ever going to happen. Why is it important? Why is this important? And, and um, always, you should always be vigilant when it comes to freedoms and liberties. Um, but do you see... Do you see any anything happening nationwide, or would it be on a state by state basis in certain states that are more prone to uh, bruise people's liberties, anyways? <laughs> yeah, I think it, it will be on a state basis. Although, again, Bartholet's recommendations in the Arizona Law Review piece really um, get to this point. I mean, she basically says it's really hard for homeschool regulations to be changed at the legislative level uh, in individual states because homeschooling parents will, um, you know, really push back against any attempts to limit mm. their homeschooling freedom. So that's where she's really focused on um, the courts and a, a real reinterpretation of, um, of liberties to, you know, basically have a children's rights perspective over, over what we've known to be true as a parent's rights perspective. And, you know, I think this is really interesting for those of us who care about self-directed education and unschooling. I mean, we want uh, freedom for our children. I mean, that's sort of what, what we advocate for, of course, um, in talking about much more, you know, freedom and flexibility and learning and personal agency and self-determination. So it can seem that, you know, we should be sympathetic to this idea of children's rights, but the trouble is, in particular in European countries that have um, adopted this viewpoint of children's rights over parental rights, it puts the state in power to decide what is in the best interest of children, and often that means a state system of education. Um, so if we want, you know, healthy and uh, free and safe, secure children, we need to have strong parental rights. The one of the common things we hear a lot is, well, don't you have to prove to someone that your kids are whatever, that they have a certain thing, right? Whatever that is. I don't know. I don't care what it is. And sometimes they don't even know. They'll just stop there. Don't you have to prove to someone that you're doing the right thing? Why is the answer no? <laughs> <laughs> According to whom, right? Who's standard? Um uh, and I think that is the real question. Are we trying to compare ourselves to a government system of education? Or are we trying to say, you know, maybe there's a different way, a better way of being educated? And, you know, it, you do find in particular that in states that, for example, have robust education choice mechanisms, there is more education innovation and experimentation and different options for children and for families. Um, because you you remove a lot of that kind of monopolistic power of government schooling. Uh, so, you know, we already see glimpses of what a decentralized education system can be, what when we allow parents choice and agency in education, uh, and we remove regulations or barriers to educational entrepreneurs who will create new education models that we haven't even imagined yet. Yeah, no, no absolutely. And, and, I, I want to thank you for here and discussing this. And, and, and final question. I want to thank everyone, by the way, for joining. A lot of questions where I ran. LinkedIn has been firing away questions. Uh, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Kate, Tom, David, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, everyone who's joined us today. Um, in Unschooling, you write about the, um, uh, the programming that exists around the school. And not just the school and what happened, but the Friday night football games. 
and the Letterman jackets and the prom and all these things that may or may not have anything to do with what happens in the classroom. And so you have that programming. And it, it's interesting that w- when you talk to a lot of people, they're like, oh, yeah, the school system's broken. It's broken. needs to be fixed. Oh, what about homeschooling? No, no, could never do that. Could never do that. It's like there's this disconnect. But once you start breaking past that, it's almost like people – people have this rote response of they can't even imagine doing anything else. And, you know, I coach and I train people on, on changing their lifestyles and their careers. And I see it there as well, but it's almost that school system of, no, we do this, we do this, we do this. You have prom, you have football, you do this, then you have a baby, then you get married. And then (laughs) right, It's, it's that kind of everything in that order. Do you, do you think that, um, despite the attacks, it's just going to be, it's just going to take the organic growth of, of, of the growth of homeschooling for people to see homeschoolers, uh, humans who have been homeschooled go out into the world and not have three heads and be radioactive. Like they think we are. (laughs) That's already happening. I mean, I, you know, we have roughly 2 million U S homeschoolers, uh, in the country. I think that we'll very likely see more of that. Um, You know, I've even been getting emails and messages from parents who said, wow, you know, I've been really considering homeschooling for a while, lack that catalyst to take the leap. This spring has provided that. And my child is flourishing. They're happier, they're calmer, calmer, they're more creative, they're loving reading books again. Um, We're gonna continue this. So I think for some families, particularly families, for whom homeschooling had always been intriguing. You know, we'll see more families adopting this model or these hybrid models or virtual schooling and other alternatives to school. I think your point about um, extracurriculars sometimes being the moderating um, accessory to make conventional schooling more palatable for students and for their parents. Um, The Mises Institute recently had a great article about this saying, in light, you know, if schools do resume in the fall, um, it's likely that they won't have, you know, athletic events or extracurricular events like theater or, uh, you know, there'll be, you know, in many cases, like the Miami-Dade school system saying they're not going to have recess, they're not going to have the cafeteria, there's going to be staggered attendance, parents won't be allowed in the building, outside visitors will be banned, those kinds of things. Um the, the article at Mises said, you know, gee, now parents might say without these uh, accessories, maybe schooling isn't all that great. If it's just about the academics, then maybe this isn't the best place for my child to be educated. Uh, and I think, again, that will trigger a lot of families to look for alternatives to conventional schooling. Well, Carrie McDonald, I appreciate you coming on the show and I appreciate you uh, being a voice for those of us who homeschool, although I would argue it's a voice for anyone who values uh, our current system, which some people want to upend, I guess, <laughs> and rewrite the Constitution, but individual liberties, uh, ideological diversity, freedom of thought. Um, I have an, a, an interview with John Osborne, who's a local VC a- angel investor here. And he just said, I asked him about the education system. He said, let me ask you, do you think, and and, and thinking growing up in school, and, and he even was talking about college, did it prepare you specifically for anything you did coming out of college? And for most people, the answer is no. So this is much broader than just protections for those of us who homeschool. So I, I want to thank you very much. Oh, thanks, Kurt. It was great to be with you. And I put a link to Carrie's book in the post, whether you're on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, wherever else we're at, yeah, YouTube. So grab her book. It's wonderful, especially I was going to say, especially if you're considering homeschooling, but some of you may have no choice going into uh, the coming school year. So there's great options, alternative models, uh, especially uh, Dan, who who asked about those models for parents who, who work Sudbury School, Democratic Schools and all those. So I want to thank everyone who participated, everyone who watched. And Carrie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks again.